feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now. Nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Young Lulin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar. Thank you so much to be with us tonight. Um, also tonight with us is Associate Professor Karen Kresser. She is my guest and she is an expert in cellular senescence. She loves to bring cellular senescence therapeutics into clinical care. That's her goal. Please uh, send us your questions because um, the presentation might trigger lots of them by using the CNA function. As always, we are starting with a short presentation, and this time by Rosina Tharin. She is a final year student at the National University of Singapore in an RS Center for Health and Longevity. And the topic is the effect of the two exercise using ex vivo serum conditioning of myoblast. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosina, as mentioned, and I will be presenting on how we are using an ex vivo serum conditioning model of myoblasts, which are essentially very early stage muscle cells, and we are using these to test the effects of exercise. So to start off, uh, with an increasingly aging population like Singapore, about a third of elderly above 60 years actually have sarcopenia, which means that they lose muscle mass and strength. And this loss is actually seen at a rate of about 1% to 2% every year. So what this means is that these people will have reduced ability to do daily tasks and also increase their risk of other chronic diseases. So with an unhealthy lifestyle that is being coupled with aging, what happens is that there are even more negative consequences on muscle health. Firstly, they, are, they have less ability to regenerate muscles that are being damaged. And when there is a decreased muscle mass and strength because of this, there is also an increased risk of diabetes because muscles actually help us to take up glucose to provide us with energy. And this keeps the hormone insulin and its sensitivity in check. But when we lose these muscles, there is increasing resistance to this insulin, which will then increase our risk of diabetes. However, when we have an active lifestyle with exercise, these negative effects are actually reduced and exercise can help to better enable muscle regeneration and in that process also reduce the risk of diabetes. So besides the effect on muscles, as we mentioned, exercise is actually known as a poly pill and it can allow for benefits across different systems from the liver to the blood vessels, heart and lungs. And these systemic effects are all linked and actually prevent a lot of the diseases that are associated with aging, which makes exercise a really important rule to test. So as we have seen, exercise has benefits across the different body systems, which is why when we are testing exercise, we propose a multidimensional angle. So this includes measuring inflammation within the blood and how this changes due to exercise, and also to look at more smaller scale environments such as the organs, tissues, and cells, and how exercise impacts each of them. And the last parameter that we are also looking at is how well one recovers from exercise, which is also something that we are putting together because it can indicate the changes in your heart and lungs that are happening because of aging. So each of these variables actually have different values, but today I'll be focusing on the one in red, which is the factor that are being secreted from the different tissue, cells, and organs following exercise. So 
Uh, some of the common methods that have been used in exercise is, for example, the in vitro muscle cell culture or mouse studies, where basically mouse are uh, made to exercise and then we measure certain changes that are happening within the mouse system. But although these systems are convenient to use, they're actually difficult to apply to humans because the way that mice respond to exercise is actually quite different from how humans would respond. And the other way is to use in vivo human studies, which are called the gold standard, but then the problem with that is that following exercise, humans have to conduct muscle biopsies, which means that their muscles are taken out and then tested for different uh, scientific changes. But then the problem with that is that it's logistically challenging and also invasive. So how we can overcome both of these limitations is by using this new method that's been developed, which is called the ex vivo serum conditioning of the tissues or cells of interest. And in this case, we are the tissues or cells that we are interested in is the myoblast, which is the early stage muscle cells. So how we are really doing this is to collect blood after exercise. We get uh, human participants to exercise either aerobically or do resistance exercise. And then we collect their blood after exercise. And then we process the blood into serum. And this serum is used to grow the myoblast, which are again, the early stage muscle cells. And then we look at what kind of factors are being secreted from these myoblasts and how fast these myoblasts grow after being conditioned to this uh, post-exercise serum. So why is this important and what does this mean, right? Is that if we see that there are certain factors that are being released from the myoblast, uh, it can indicate that there's some form of damage, inflammation, or even regenerative markers of muscles. So these markers can indicate that maybe the myoblasts are growing following exercise, which can indicate and be a form of proof that there is some form of muscle regenerative processes that are being kicked in following exercise. And these can happen due to certain markers that are being secreted from the muscles or the myoblasts in this case. So these findings will, are still at its initial stages. And in the future, we will be testing various factors that are being secreted from these myoblasts to eventually determine if exercise and the resulting circulating factors in the blood actually help to increase skeletal muscle mass. And why is this important? It's because this model allows us to use a less invasive, but also very physiologically relevant model to see which types of exercise or which intensities of exercise are, are favorable in preventing certain diseases and in enabling muscle regeneration. So with that, we've come to the end of our, I've come to the end of our presentation. These are my acknowledgements. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, really showing that myoblasts maybe are a secret. Over to our presenter of today, and that's Associate Professor Karen Foster, and she works at the NUS Department of Physiology, but also she is affiliated with the Center for Health Longevity of NUHS, and also has a joint uh, appointment as Principal Investigator at ASTAR. And Karen studied microbiology at the National University of Singapore and did her PhD in uh, studying cell cycles at ASTAR in the lab of Professor Utam Tirana. She studies at the moment the biological mechanisms underlying cell stress responses in two things, and that's cancer and that is aging. And particularly, she is really known for her research on cellular senescence. And there, she really wants to bring treatments into clinical practice, especially for cancer patients. She is quite passionate, next to her research, to really have a uh, gender and race balance and diversity in, in STEM. And she is also the UN United Nations Women in Science Ambassador. She has a little bit of secret what she does in her free time, and that is being physically and mentally fit. And she does that as a certified Zumba instructor and also as a Bollywood dance choreographer. So I think it's beautiful to combine the, the hobby next to being an ambassador for gender and race diversity with lots of research. So Karen, it's an honor to have you here tonight, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Andrea, for the very nice introduction. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this webinar. Uh, so uh, as Andrea mentioned, I'm really passionate about cellular senescence. And uh, we are a lab that conducts studies in the cancer aging realm. And we ask questions such as, why is aging a risk factor for cancer, 
or why cancer and cancer treatments may um, in some instances accelerate aging and age-associated disease. And today I'll be telling you a bit about a hallmark of aging known as cellular senescence in the cancer context, which is, uh, uh, and um, especially after chemotherapy. And uh, although in the cancer context, uh, I think our study will also uh, pose some lessons for aging, especially from a cell biology and microenvironment uh, perspective. Oops. Okay. So uh, why do we need to, first of all, understand the aging process better? Uh, this is more for the uh, newbies that are attending this webinar. Uh, firstly, what is aging? So it's essentially a degenerative multifactorial process caused by molecular and cellular damage, which leads to chronic inflammation and tissue dysfunction. And age is the biggest risk factor for chronic disease. So these include diabetes, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease, uh, kidney disease, cancers, which all share age as a common strong risk factor. And so it's obvious that aging is a major contributor to global morbidity and mortality. Uh, besides chronic and acute disease, uh, aging also leads to an overall uh, functional decline and an individual who ages unhealthily can have, have uh, impaired activity, cannot live independently, and has an overall reduced quality of life. And uh, since health costs rise with an aging population, uh, rapidly aging populations such as ours also pose global socioeconomic challenge. Uh, in Singapore, those aged 80 and older are the fastest growing segment in Singapore's uh, aging population. Uh, in fact, human life expectancy has increased remarkably worldwide and the rise is projected to continue. However, health span, which is the portion of life uh, free of uh, major disease and disability, is not increasing as fast as lifespan. So the goal here in understanding the aging process is not to live longer per se, but the emphasis is more on healthy aging so that our later years will be free of major uh, chronic disease and disability. So uh, there's a synergistic bi-directional relationship between cancer and aging. So age is a risk factor for adult cancers and uh, emerging evidence suggests that cancer and its treatments might accelerate aging pathologies. In some individuals, cancer and its treatments are actually hypothesized uh, to create sufficient damage to accelerate or accentuate the rate of aging compared with that expected in the absence of cancer. Uh, so um, it's unknown if uh, cancer or its treatments cause multiple hits to biological systems leading to a parallel uh, normal aging trajectory with a weakened functional reserve. Uh, this is known as the accentuated aging hypothesis, or um, if uh, cancer and treatments might cause an altered aging trajectory with quicker uh, project, uh, progression to functional decline, uh, which is known as the accelerated uh, aging hypothesis. Um, compelling evidence from uh, long-term follow-up studies of uh, pediatric and adolescent and young adult cancer survivors suggests that cancer treatment contribute to the onset of aging-related conditions such as incident comorbidities, functional loss, frailty, and cognitive decline decades earlier in life than expected. Uh, furthermore, observational studies have also shown that um, survivors of comorbid conditions and um, uh, so survivors actually of uh, adult onset cancers have a higher burden of uh, mobility limitations and pain and a greater risk of uh, functional and cognitive impairments uh, compared with healthy aged matched controls. 
Evidence from preclinical models also show that radiation and genotoxic and cytotoxic anti-cancer therapies such as cisplatin, doxorubicin, paclitaxel, and TMZ, tomozolo, uh, might cause physiological changes consistent with sev several uh, molecular and cellular hallmarks of aging. And these include uh, increased inflammation, uh, expanded senescence, cell burden, uh, decreased stem cells, persistent DNA damage, and decreased telomere length. So this talk will focus specifically on uh, two aging hallmarks uh, in cancer, cellular senescence and altered intercellular communication. And uh, just a point here, um, so routine physical activity actually attenuates many hallmarks of aging and uh, exercise training for supportive care during breast cancer treatment is well established uh, with a plethora of reports showing that it improves treatment outcomes and reduces risk of cancer occurrence. So our lab will be testing specific clinical exercise intervention in preventing and mitigating uh, treatment associated aging and tumor recurrence via uh, modulation of the therapy-induced uh, secretome uh, in breast cancer patients receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy at the National Cancer Center. This will be done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Jomin Go, an assistant uh, professor at the Center for Healthy Longevity, who's also an exercise physiologist, and Dr. Elaine Lim at the National Cancer Center, Singapore. So stay tuned for the findings of that study once it's completed. So we'll go to cellular senescence. So cellular senescence is a stress response triggered by telomere attrition, uh, DNA damage, ROS, aberrant oncogene activation, or as we will see later, treatment with chemotherapeutics. And this results in a permanent cell cycle arrest. So the senescent secretome, also known as the CESP, or the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, um, is a consist, uh, contains a myriad of soluble factors, uh, such as interleukins, chemokines, receptors and ligands, growth factors, uh, proteases, and other insoluble factors like collagens, fibronectin, and lamins. And these um, are when these are secreted, they modulate the microenvironment and um, around them. So um, basically what happens is that when cells become uh, senescent, triggered by all these different causal factors, uh, they secrete CESP. And this CESP can actually uh, function in two ways. One, in an autocrine manner, where it functions uh, and it acts on itself. Um, so in this case, in age-associated disease, what happens is that the CESP uh, reinforces the senescence. Uh, and there can also be um, CESP acting in a paracrine senescence manner where it causes the neighboring cells to become senescent and also the immune cells to become immunosenescent. So um, usually senescent cells, in some cases, uh, activate the immunosurveillance to um, uh, eliminate the senescent cells. But because these immune cells, um, as you grow older, enter immunosenescence, uh, senescent cells uh, accumulate. And senescent cells are actually found in every part of the body, uh, as in, and it accumulates as we age. And they have actually been shown to directly uh, contribute to all these diseases uh, because there have been studies, mostly in animal uh, models, uh, not so much in humans yet, um, where people have actually inhibited senescence and CESP and uh, mitigated the uh, or alleviated these age-associated diseases. Okay, so now let's go to therapy-induced senescence. And in the lab, one of the models we use is uh, triple negative breast cancer. So although constituting a minority of uh, breast cancers, uh, triple negative breast cancers or TNBCs account for a disproportionately uh, high metastasis and mortality rates and is known as the most aggressive breast cancer subtype with 
poor prognosis. And TNBC is also associated with an elevated risk of disease relapse with distant metastasis related to visceral metastasis such as lung, liver, and the brain. And since treatment for TNBC is restricted due to the lack of specific targets, uh, conventional cytotoxic, cytotoxic therapies, uh, such as um, the one uh, we are interested in the lab, uh, such as the anti-mitotic chemotherapies that, that specifically target the mitosis, mitotic phase of the cell cycle, um, so particularly the taxanes, uh, either alone in combination uh, uh, either alone or in combination. And uh, so uh, these taxanes, uh, such as paclitaxel or doxotaxel, uh, they usually, um, even in this advent of immunotherapy, they remain as first-line uh, broad-spectrum treatment for uh, breast cancers. And uh, paclitaxel is a well-known uh, natural uh, source a cancer drug derived from the bark of the Pacific um, yew tree. And it's actually the number one selling chemotherapy and the most commonly used. However, um, disease re uh, uh, sets in, disease relapse and tumor recurrence sets in. So we in the lab wanted to find out um, why and how to um, tackle this. So we, uh, our previous work, we studied this process called mitotic slippage. So I'll just go through a bit. In, uh, so uh, you first treat your breast cancer cell line with uh, anti-mitotic drugs such as paclitaxel, and uh, this usually leads to an arrest during the mitotic phase called the mitotic arrest. And after some mitotic uh, uh, period of arrest, uh, the cells will go to mitotic cell death. However, there can be another cell fate. Some cells go through this process called mitotic slippage, uh, which we characterized in lab. So um, mitotic slippage basically is a premature exit of mitosis uh, without proper chromosome segregation and cytokinesis. So because there's no proper chromosome segregation cytokinesis, you end up being a tetraploid, or uh, you have the double the DNA content, and these cells um, arrest in the next cell cycle in the G1 phase. And these tetraploid G1 arrest, arrested cells then either go through uh, post-slippage death or senescence. And of course, we were interested in senescence, especially because uh, the thing is like when we started uh, looking at the senescence state, people um, did not really bother about the uh, therapy-induced senescent state because um, people uh, generally thought that it's okay if you either die or you arrest um, permanently because cellular senescence is uh, basically a state of permanent cell cycle arrest. However, um, as you'll see and know uh, more about later, uh, so we know now that senescent cells secrete CESP. So uh, in the lab, we actually were interested in characterizing um, what uh, this the impact of this CESP. And um, so, uh, it, so CESP in the context of therapy-induced senescence, they can actually cause tumor suppression or they can cause uh, tumor promotion. And we wanted to find out, uh, in our case, um, what's the uh, impact of Paclitaxel induced uh, CESP. And um, so basically, we first looked at the CESP factors, um, bo both by gene expression and also the secretion of CESP factors by Luminex. And uh, we see that there's a high upregulation up compared to the control, the antimitotic drug, which is the red bars, uh, compared to the control. Um, they showed an upregulation of cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, which are all um, kind of tumor promoting um, uh, factors. And uh, so we knew that um, there could possibly be an induction of a paracrine signaling mechanism that could potentially promote uh, tumors. Um, 
in the neighboring cells. So to test this, what we did was we got cells that were either uh, treated, control the MSO or the antimitotic drug uh, treated. Here we used nocorazole first for the cell lines because nocorazole was an is actually a relatively easier drug to study in a cell population because it does not cause much cell death. Um, so uh, we we grew these for two days and then released it to a lower amount of um, FPS because of course FPS itself can drive tumor promotion. And then we took the condition media um, which basically contained the SAS factors. And we did a wound healing assay. Uh, and we see basically in the wound healing assay for migration, uh, when you incubate your CESP with the cells, you can see that uh, the ones that uh, were treated with um, nocorosol closed faster, so migrated uh, faster towards the wound. And so that so there was actually a greater um, wound closure. This indicated that the SAS could actually um, have um, migratory capabilities and it could promote uh, migration uh, in the neighboring cells. And we also did a transfer assay to check for invasion. And uh, this assay, basically, you have like a, a barrier where you plate your um, cells either treated with a control or with the anti-mitotic drug. And again, we see that there's a greater invasive capacity to invade the barrier uh, with, uh, upon the SAS from the ones that were treated with uh, the therapy-induced senescent cells. And uh, this as well, the SAS from therapy-induced senescent cells could actually um, lead to greater sprouting of the mouse eye uh, choroids, um, indicating increased uh, blood vessel formation and so greater uh, angiogenesis. So all these together, taken together, showed that the SAS following um, the treatment with paclitaxel, mitotic slippage, and senescence, the SAS was proteomerogenic. So it, then we went to the to see whether it can be extrapolated to the patient samples and mouse model first of all. So in the mouse model, we saw that uh, in a xenograft mouse model that was. Um, uh, that was treated with uh, paclitaxel and became and showed resistance. Those paclitaxel resistant tumor cells uh, uh, stained positive for beta gal. So um, compared to the control, and both nocorosol treated and paclitaxel treated showed a very high incidence of uh, SA beta gal, um, showing positivity for senescence. Also, we looked at um, the score for P21, and we saw that in the tissues of the uh, the tumor tissues in the xenograft mouse model, we see that the ones that were uh, resistant to paclitaxel uh, were also senescent, uh, showed greater P21 score compared to the control. And then we also looked at breast cancer patient samples. So interestingly, the ones uh, that were before pretreatment, we didn't see senescence, but after post-treatment, we saw, uh, and these were actually um, the, the ones that showed chemo resistance after post-paclitaxel um, treatment. These showed also uh, high P21 positivity compared to pretreatment. And we also analyzed uh, normal re uh, region without cancer, and the a, a tumor region with the central region and the invasive front. So the invasive front usually of the breast cancer, um, they may that may actually reflect the tumor prognosis better than other parts of the tumor. And we see that uh, at the invasive front, there's a very high, much higher P21 level um, compared to the normal and the central um, position and also the assay beta gal as well, uh, the invasive front showed much higher degree of beta gal uh, positive staining compared to the normal and center and as well like so P21 P and P27 as well. Um, yeah, so, so basically all these showed uh, that the um, 
peptidoxal resistant tumor cells displayed uh, high incidence of senescence. And it's interestingly, what we also realized was, uh, because we are also a chromosomal instability lab, so we looked at the uh, number of chromosomes and chromosome gains and chromosome loss. So interestingly, we saw that um, the pectotexal resistant tumor cells that where uh, they, uh, they were, this was a correlation with senescence. So um, uh, those that were therapy, showed therapy-induced senescence and tumor recurrence, they also showed uh, increased aberrant polyploidy, um, uh, sorry, aberrant ploidy uh, gain or loss, uh, but they also show increased polyploidy. So in some situations, you see like uh, the ploidy number as well. DV. So for example, here is a normal chromosome, uh, two copies. So this is like uh, deployed. But a lot of these cancers which show which undergo therapy induced senescence, they either uh, they show so this is like invasive front. So the invasive fronts show more therapy induced senescence, and uh, they deviated a lot from the normal copy number. So you can see that it even goes up to seven copies of uh, chromosomes in uh, the tissue. So. Basically, we found an association between therapy induced senescence, tumor recurrence, and uh, chromosomal instability. Okay, so so for now we can we found then um, at this point that the therapy induced senescence cells were indeed highly secretory and they had residual disease after chemotherapy and um, they also contributed to tumor relapse. And um, so um, in the past two or three years, um, this um, uh, entity called small extracellular vesicles so, and exosomes fall into this. So small extracellular vesicles, uh, although they um, have been found as part of the senescence uh, phenotype, they, are, they have a rather underappreciated role as a CESP component. And they are a CESP, considered a CESP component because they are secreted from the senescent cells. Um, so we set out to find whether the therapy-induced senescent cells um, had SEVs, first of all. Um, so so be, I think before I go into what SEVs are, I'll first talk about like what are these small extracellular vesicles. So these small extracellular vesicles, uh, they are si they have the size about thirty nanometers to one hundred and fifty nanometers, and um, they are actually critical, known as critical mediators of intercellular communication communication because uh, they they harbor the characteristics of the cell that uh, they are released from. And uh, they can uh, travel through the bloodstream or the lymphatic tissue and be taken up by other cells. And uh, and by when the other cells take up these uh, small extracellular vesicles, they can actually be changed by uh, these small extracellular vesicles. And so uh, uh, they're basically lipid membrane vesicles released by all cells and found in most biological fluids. And interesting, the interesting part is they, uh, con their cargo contains proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, such as DNA, mRNA, and uh, microRNA. So when these are taken up from, these are transferred from, say, the donor cell to the uh, recipient cell, the recipient cell can also uh, take up these proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids and be changed. So in some situations, um, a exosome from or a small extracellular vesicle from a cancer cell, if it goes to a normal cell, the normal cell can become tumorigenic just by taking up the extracellular vesicles. And uh, yeah. So in the aging context, uh, EVs can also induce paracrine senescence. So from one senescent cell, it has been shown uh, to actually affect other neighboring cells uh, that uh, through paracrine senescence uh, because of its cargo. And in the senescent state, actually, um, the 
EVs were actually first taught to remove uh, toxic cytoplasmic DNA um, and to maintain the cellular homeostasis. Stasis. So EVs were first basically just thought of as uh, garbage cans, uh, but now it's uh, very obvious that they are actually functioning in uh, intercellular communication and uh, modulating function and influencing the tumor microenvironment. So um, so we set out to ask, actually, uh, Rekha and Matt in my lab, um, they drove this project. So the question he asked was, what is the impact of the small extracellular vesicles uh, released from therapy-induced senescent breast cancer cells? And uh, so this was just to show that um, uh, before we um, get uh, study the EVs from the senescence, this is just to show that the mouse uh, 41 cells were indeed senescent. So they showed like a high uh, enlarged um, formation with uh, high vacuolation, vacu a lot of vacuoles, uh, flattened morphology and enlarged. And even after um, the drug was removed and um, it was released into normal media, they still showed the same morphology sh showing that it's true senescence, it's, it's a bona fide senescence state. And uh, so these cells also showed that uh, there was a tetraploidy, so showing that it did the 41 cells are similar to the uh, human breast cancer cell. So 41 basically is a mouse uh, TNBC cell as well. So these 41 cells uh, also went through mitotic slippage and, and ended up as tetraploid G1 cells. And as you can see, the loss of mitosis uh, markers here and spindle assembly checkpoint here. And by beta cell staining, you can see there's an increased amount of um, uh, assay beta gal compared to the control. And also lemon B1 is uh, lost. So lemon B1 is actually one of the uh, most reliable marker for senescence uh, because sometimes beta-gal uh, assays can be subjective. So, so sometimes depending on whether there's high confluency um, or um, the, uh, the number of days you leave the beta-gal assay for, um, you can have uh, the blue color change. Um, so it's, it's, it can be subjective, but in my experience, I found that lamin B1 degradation is a great marker for uh, looking at senescence. And um, also uh, uh, in senescence like SASP, um, so SASP is increased tremendously the, in senescent cells and senescent cells as well. You usually see a lot more uh, extracellular vesicles compared to the control. So here the therapy induced senescent cells do show a lot more um, uh, EVs compared to control. This was um, measured by the nanosite equipment. And also here we see markers of um, EVs like Alex, TSG101, all uh, going up in the therapy induced senescent cells, but not in the control cells. So basically, now that we had this therapy induced senescence derived EVs from the mouse 41 cells, um, we looked at uh, growth in vivo. And uh, so basically, what we did was we first made a 41 cell uh, a breast cancer mouse model. And uh, once tumor reached about 100 um, mm cube uh, in size, we then injected these uh, therapy-induced senescence EVs or the control EVs that were not treated with the cells from cells that were not treated with uh, paclitaxel. And we um, uh, gave injections every uh, five injections every other day intratumorally. So uh, this was actually done with uh, Lena Lim's lab. So she helped us with this mouse work. And um, so uh, we were very surprised by the uh, the findings we got because um, we had expected the, uh, because it's also from the senescent secretome, which we saw was protumorigenic, but we the mouse models showed that this was actually anti-tumorigenic. 
So uh, the, the EVs itself, if you take the EVs itself, you do see tumor regression um, instead of what you would expect with just the uh, cess factors. And so the tumor weight and tumor volume uh, compared to from the TIS uh, SEV compared to the control and the saline control as well, you see much less tumor weight and volume. So there was a clear tumor regression. And uh, here, when you looked at the mouse tissues, uh, immunohistochemistry, you see that uh, there's a very dark staining with uh, beta gel. So it's highly senescent. And, um, uh, and, and there's like uh, also a lot of uh, DNA damage, gamma H2X and, um, in, and P53 uh, in the uh, EVs from the therapy into senescent cells. And also a lot more inflammation, nf kappa b um, activity is much higher in the therapy-induced senescence, EVs compared to the control and the saline. And also this uh, natural killer, um, NKG2D, and also uh, P16, they are much higher. So all these show that there's a pro-inflammatory senescent state that's going on after uh, injection with the extracellular vesicles. So uh, we wanted to understand this better. So we also looked at it in using human TNBCs. And in human TNBCs, again, this, this is just to show that uh, these cells were indeed uh, senescent. Uh, so beta gal SA, lemon B1, P21, phosphoribose. Uh, so it was hypophosphorylated. So all these show that it's senescent and uh, P53 was also phosphorylated. So we then took EVs, extracellular vesicles from these. So the way we make extracellular vesicles uh, or we, we get extracellular vesicles from these cells is we use the differential centrifugation method combined with size exclusion method. And uh, we then look at uh, which fraction after the size exclusion chromatography method uh, can give us the EVs, and we see that this fraction, uh, F7 to 12, gave us the most uh, EVs. And as you can see here also, uh, the nanosite um, measurement showed that compared to the um, control EV, the tumor-induced, therapy-induced senescence EVs uh, showed much higher number um, uh, compared to this, uh, the ones that were not treated and the ones that actually didn't go into senescence. So indeed, again, like the senescent cells usually have harbor a lot more EVs compared to the um, control cells. And uh, again, EM uh, is always needed when you do any EV work because the reviewers will not never believe that they are EVs unless you show them in electron microscopy. So we work hand in hand a lot with uh, Isabel, um, at uh, the EM unit at NUS. So here also we can see uh, clearly the EVs um, compared and control, there are some, but in the therapy into senescent cells, you see a lot more. So we then incubated these EVs, the TIS EVs uh, and the control EVs with the MDMB231 cells and we see, we saw that the same as what we saw in the mouse model, there is actually less migration. Uh, the wound closes um, much less compared to the uh, no EV control and the, uh, the DMSO treated uh, control. And um, the, um, the, my, the invasion assay also showed the similar uh, the TIS EVs showed much less uh, invasion compared to the no EVs and control SEVs. So um, we also then did um, this. We were curious whether what would happen if we inhibited the EVs in the SASP. Uh, could we actually kind of rescue this phenotype? So SASP itself, we know that causes... Um, uh, migration and invasion. So this is a very nice zebrafish assay because zebrafish are nice for models for uh, looking or visualizing malignancy because they are transparent. So here you can see SASP actually 
um, the invasion index and migration index they are high as expected because they they it's proteomergenic cells and the the EVs itself, you can see uh, the invasion and migration assay is a bit less. And when we inhibit the EVs from the SASP, um, the SASP, the, the SEV deficient SASP can now um, promote tumors again. So now we are actually doing a lot of assays, proteomics, um, uh, transcriptomics, and uh, a whole lot of other assays to actually see the mechanism behind uh, what's going on, what's in the EV, what's in the cargo, and uh, what, how actually is the ratio between uh, the SASP and SEV, and whether we can use this information for therapeutics. And uh, so uh, this is just a diagram to show that actually you have cellular senescence since, uh, you have senescent cells since uh, birth, but as you grow older, these senescent cells um, accumulate, and uh, with the more senescent you accumulate, the higher is the risk of uh, age-associated disease. This, so scientists are actually trying to come up with uh, synotude therapeutics uh, to diminish or reduce the senescence and CESP uh, accumulation, thereby reversing this step. So there are two classes, main classes of synotherapeutics, synolytics, uh, which basically eliminates senescent cells, and synomorphics, which um, uh, basically inhibits the CESP. And the, the famous examples of synolytics are uh, things like the satinib, cassetin, uh, nevitoplex, which is a BCL2 inhibitor. And um, these actually have shown efficacy in a lot of mouse models, and uh, cinemorphics have also shown um, uh, efficacy in reducing CESP and uh, thereby uh, mitigating uh, the uh, severity of age-associated diseases. And uh, so uh, one possibility we are thinking of to, is to actually, now that we know that uh, the soluble CES factors of the uh, from the senescent secretome is has a different function from the senescence associated EVs. We're thinking of using uh, synomorphic to now suppress the senescence associated secretory um, uh, phenotype, that, specifically the soluble factors, uh, and thereby increase. This will increase the uh, EVs and. Uh, uh, when the EVs are actually increased, there's a more um, like a pro-inflammatory and uh, uh, anti-tumorigenic effect. So we'll, 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 we have still a lot more work to do, but this is what we uh, want, we propose to do um, from the studies and data we have so far. So here I'll come to the end of my talk. So um, I would like to thank Matt and uh, Rika and uh, who drove this and all my collaborators um, at uh, NUS and overseas. And of course, special thanks to the breast cancer patients at NCCS, uh, NRF and MOE for funding, as well as all the colleagues at the Healthy Longevity Center for uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. Great presentation. And um, what a uh, nice experiment and results uh, in the last, I would say, one to two years. So congratulations to the Thank you. Uh, nice, nice result. May, may I start quite uh, with a very general question, because I don't think that you have touched on it. How do you really measure senescence? And you know that it's senescent cell in, in your laboratory. What kind of markers do you use? Yeah, so we can't actually just use one marker. It has to be multifactorial. Uh, and there is also no true senescence markers. If you see, every, everything is called senescence associated. Uh, so it's like senescence associated lemon B1. So in our experience, lemon B1 always gets degraded in the uh, senescence uh, cell. So we always include lemon B1. We also include P21, P16, and P27. These are all 
uh, known as uh, CDK, cycle independent kinase inhibitors, and and post cell cycle arrest. But sometimes we don't see one or the other. So P21, P16, P27 may or not may or not uh, may be there or may not be there. And um, uh, and also things like the beta gal uh, assay, and also there's something called senescence associated heterochromatin foci because the chromatin itself is modified. Uh, in senescence. So we also use that. But having said that, it's much easier to find all this in cell lines as compared to if you want to look at um, blood uh, cells or patient samples, uh, it becomes a bit more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what you're using is really um, the definition of the ICSA, the International Cell Senescence Association. You should have at least two, and it's even better to have three. Okay, great. Um, that, that's good um, to know. Um, I'm a little bit uh, puzzled. It, it's great to know that the therapeutics for cancer actually now induce cancer. I think the books can be closed that senescence uh, per se might also induce cancer. So what's the chicken and the egg here? So if you do research in cancer patients, how do you know that that senescent state was not there before the cancer, and maybe even what's the reason for that cancer. Yeah, so, so, how do you disentangle cancer induction uh, of induced senescence and senescence which might be already there? Yeah, so this is a bit difficult to dissect. So, so what we usually do is we have a pre-treatment, uh, so uh, pre-treatment and post-treatment, but then uh, and then we compare, but then again, like. Senescent cells are there throughout life. It's not only when you age. You see more as you age, but it's actually there before. So, so this is a bit difficult to tangle. But uh, in, our, in our studies, we always, in therapy, we usually look at pre-therapy and post-therapy. And uh, at least in the therapy-induced senescence uh, context. But uh, having said that, there can also be senescence without chemotherapy. Yeah, I, I, I get that. And then you also, of course, have to take into account that if you have and manage that biopsy from the surgeon, that you need so many layers to ana uh, analyze because sometimes also the magnitude of the senescent cells is, is not really there. So there's yeah. a huge intra-individual variation and inter-individual variation too. Yes. So I think you, you manage that well. Let's go to a, to a next topic, and that's the very nice EVs, extracellular vesicles. So really are a little bit the packages circulating in our, our bodies. What do you think, because I learned in, in, in medical school that cancer is there and will replicate before cells are replicating. So now you are saying that the EVs are a little bit um, in, infectious to actually make from a normal cell a, another cancer cell. So what do you think is the contribution of EVs in that process of my statuses or, or or growing cancers. Yeah. So so EVs, uh, depending on where they come from. Uh, so so a lot of times, um, say for example, in our case, we see it from a senescent cell. So uh, it could be therefore um, that's why the cargo might be more senescent. Uh, but a lot of times, actually, uh, in disease. Uh, so, so basically, this EVs can be a systemat systemic influence because, like, say, uh, from one tumor, the incident tumor site, uh, you can actually shed, basically, or release these EVs, which then can travel long distances. And EVs, by the way, they are the uh, longest traveling uh, distance uh, entities in the body. So they travel the furthest than any other entity in the body. So in this way, they can actually um, kind of like travel long distances to other organs and uh, say like from the breast to lung and then change it in that way. It, so for metastasis, um, so in that way also, that's why people a lot of times they use EVs as biomarkers um, because you can tell by looking at the EVs itself, because from the biomarker or the cargo of the EVs, you can tell sometimes if it carries 
a breast cancer related marker in the lung, then you know that, okay, it originated from the breast, right? So in the process of aging itself, uh, actually, um, in this case also, you can tell actually uh, which, uh, so the EVs, like for example, in aging, they talk more about paracrine senescence. So these, uh, in combination, uh, not only with senescence markers, but you can also look at uh, markers that are related to a specific uh, tissue uh, that, uh, yeah, so so it's kind of more like a systemic influence uh, in the body. Yeah, so that's why actually people are now investing a lot in trying to also, um, at least in uh, situations where EVs are harmful, to at least come up with um, uh, clinically uh, valid uh, EV inhibitors to use in the clinics. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, absolutely. Before going to Nanglu to really see what kind of questions we have from the audience, um, I think it's a lot. One more question for me. What would you advise to young researchers who want to start their own research topic? How to choose that? And what is your advice before you went through that stage? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very interesting question. And I think, like, for me, it was always just the uh, passion in the subject. Like, uh, um, yeah, not not like what is a hot topic, not like what will give you a, a better job next time. It's, yeah. it's always been like the interest uh, in the topic. So I've always been interested in the cell cycle, actually, mainly by mitosis. So if you see, like, I've been in, uh, looking at mitotic chromosome for a long time. I, I think so, yes. No, no, <laughs> you don't have to say that. You are really loving the mitotic cycles, etc. <laughs> but there are so many questions from the audience. So let's go. No, absolutely. So follow your heart. I think that's your, your answer, isn't it? Yes. Okay, great. Going to, don't move. What are yeah, the questions of the audience? Thank you, Angie, and thank you very much, Karen, for the great talk. Now I'm going to ask some of the questions from the audience. It seems like many of our audience are interested in cancer accelerated aging itself because it may sound like a really new concept for them. So the first question is that are the characteristics of cancer accelerated aging similar to normal aging? If so, which pathways in particular? So the definition itself of cancer-related aging uh, actually answers this question because to classify something as uh, cancer-accelerated aging, uh, the there are like three three basic criteria. Uh, so one is that the physical manif manifestation of the cancer-accelerated aging uh, should be identical to normal aging. Secondly, the mechanism underlying uh, the cancer accelerated aging also should be similar to uh, normal aging. So basically both the physical manifestation and the uh, mechanism underlying. And thirdly, that the um, aging uh, mechanism and uh, manifestation uh, is found at a much younger age to be qualified as uh, cancer accelerated aging. Yeah. So they basically share similar standards. Yes, yes. Another audience asks, is, is it senescence or the biological age-associated organ, organism failure to naturally clear senescent cells? That's the problem. Sorry, what, what's that again? Like he, he was asking, is it senescence itself? or biological age-associated against or, or more failure to naturally clear the senescent cells. Yeah. Uh, that's why is the problem. Yeah, so it, it's a combination. It's actually a combination. So, of course, we when we study something, we, uh, we usually look at, uh, say, for example, senescence and inflammation. But actually, everything, there's a hallmarks of aging, right? So every, it's multifactorial process. So... It, it's also as we age, our immune um, system also declines. So it's I think it's a combination of both both CESP driven as well as the immune system is uh, declining. 
Uh, I see. Uh, I'm kind of going to the next question now. Um, another topic. So they were asking, are you looking at the consequences of cancer treatments on other age-related complications? Yeah. So, so for us, actually, uh, we've just started uh, working with uh, Dr. Leonard Yeo and uh, Eng Su Yap, Dr. Eng Su Yap at uh, NUH to look at the consequence of uh, cancer and cancer treatment on of uh, on uh, ischemic stroke uh, because actually cancer patients have like about two to three times higher incidence of uh, stroke so uh, we are trying to find out uh, why exactly and so yeah so so basically it's another the impact of cancer on another age associated disease so in this case we are looking at uh, stroke sounds good look forward to that finding thank you. Um, so now we're going to the EV because that seems to attract a lot of interest from the audience. So you mentioned that EV can carry markers for specific tissues, right? Yes. So is there any guidance provided to the EV to move to the recipient side particularly, or is it just a random process? I think uh, so far it's... Uh, basically, from what I know, it's a random process, but then... Uh, yeah, so so like uh, Min in uh, NUS Min Le, she studies red blood uh, cell EV. So a lot of them go to spleen, but that's just because like uh, it has an affinity, a homing pattern. Uh, so in some in some situations, there's a homing uh, signal to go to certain organs, but then a lot of times there's no uh, such homing signal uh, to go to various organs so it can be it can be random but it can it and but at the same time for some specific evs uh, it can be uh, they have a signal uh, that's leading them to those, those are the related to the markers that you mentioned uh, yeah yeah uh, th th those actually uh, they will carry something like a ligand and a receptor yeah so that really has therapeutic potential in some sense. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, earlier on, you and Andrea were also discussing about the relation between senescence and cancer. Actually, some of our audience also mentioned we should really do more research on relation between aging and cancer. So in your opinion, which synolytic therapeutics hold more potential for healthy longevity and what risks, if any, they could bring in relation to cancer control? Yeah. So I, I don't know uh, which exactly <laughs> because there, there's a lot of synotherapeutics, but then uh, like things like fisetin, fisetin has actually, uh, so uh, of course a lot of this is in mouse models, Fisetin, at least it has been trial tried in human, but more for uh, to test uh, frailty. And a lot of this work is actually being done by Jim Kirkland and others at the Mayo Clinic. So he's they've been mostly looking in the context of aging, but I know that they are also starting a fisetin trial in uh, breast cancer survivors. So uh, combining uh, basically a xenotherapeutic with cancer survivors that were uh, like uh, treated previously with chemo. So um, in that sense, I think um, because fisetin I know has worked also desetinib and cosetin that also has worked. But again, uh, uh, so desetinib and cosetin I know it's worked in uh, idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So, but I, uh, and also, also it's been used in uh, cancer. So I think that could be another synotherapeutic uh, 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 that might be useful. Yeah. What's the second part of the question? Oh, so uh, the audience were asking what risks, if any, the similar therapeutics could bring in relation to cancer control? Yeah. So, so actually, so uh, we, I think also um, the type of uh, synotherapeutic to be used uh, is crucial. And it's, again, like, uh, has to be done, like, uh, person by person. Like, like also, it, like, things like the dose matters, the timing you give matters. Because, like, in our case, say, for example, uh, like, uh, so there are a lot of 
common signaling molecules between cancer and uh, aging that can be targeted, like IGF-1, insulin growth factor 1, FOXO, MAP kinase. Uh, if you see like uh, P38 um, uh, and uh, like uh, nf kappa b and like a lot of different um, common signaling molecules, even uh, like autophagy. But say, for example, in our previous work, we also showed that like, uh, so autophagy is good in aging. You want autophagy to uh, get rid of uh, the toxic substances. But in our previous work, we showed that um, after paclitaxel treatment in early early cases, uh, like soon after paclitaxel, uh, the autophagy is beneficial. However, at later stages, the autophagy actually induces senescence, therapy induced senescence and SASP and therapy resistance. So if you were to actually have something like uh, 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 like rapamycin or metformin, uh, which actually activates autophagy. So in that case, um, if you combine it with Paclitaxel, for example, it's going to do the opposite of what is intended in aging, right? So, and also cancer has like, it's more complex because there's a P53 mutation as well uh, that can complicate uh, things. So in, uh, in cancer, actually, P53 wild type cells tend to go more into senescence and the mutant P53 respond more to uh, chemo. So uh, in that situation also, if you use any other drugs, then... I yeah, think there is lots to discuss and I think it's a beautiful answer. topic. <laughs> <laughs> so I will take over here now. Yeah. <laughs> there okay. were so many questions from the audience and uh, so many nice answers. Thank you so much, uh, Karen, and um, for your lovely uh, research in on uh, really facilitating this, this discussion so well. So uh, we're at the end of this webinar. Um, please leave your uh, comments in the chat uh, function. Use the panelists and all that use the option. We're still recruiting for lots of studies we are doing at the Center for Health Longevity. So please uh, visit our website and you will also find information there uh, about job opportunities and much, much more. I will host our next episode on the 18th of May this year and I hope to see you there. I will close the webinar with a little bit of laughter. Take care. You know, sometimes, you know, as much as you try to fight the whole change and aging process, sometimes things happen that are just so strong in your face, just smacks you dead in your face, that you just have to go, okay, it is what it is. It's a true story. I'm, I'm coming out of the mall, right? Walking out of the mall and, and I'm just digging through my purse, just rifling through my bag. And, and you know, I'm talking to my friend and, and she could tell that I was distracted. She's like, Wanda, are you listening to me? I was like, girl, I'm sorry, but I think I left my cell phone in the store. <laughs> And she goes, okay, well, call me back when you find it. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it. And nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down